everybody, this is Jeremiah Craig. This is Ask a Bootmaker. Today, we are talking to Phil Jiharo of Hondo Boots. Like, Hondo Boots has been around forever. They are one of the most traditional cowboy boot companies still around. So I'm pumped to talk to Phil and get this thing going. Hey, Phil, how's it going? Great to see you. Yeah, great to see you too. Thanks for having me. Definitely. I'm so excited to, uh, to have, have you on here. It's not often that I get the chance to talk to people who have been in the industry since what? You, you've been in the industry since you're five years old, you said? Since 1975, the day wow. I was born. The day wow. I was born. My, it's, uh, it's my dad's company. For, for everyone out there who's wondering, how does that work? <laughs> started in 1965, correct? My dad started in 1965, yes. Why did your dad start it? And I don't think we ever talked about this before, the history of how and why your dad started Hondo Boots. Okay, so my dad had a um, band of brothers, uh, a few brothers, who were across the border from El Paso, Texas in Ciudad Juarez. And they had a small shop where they were making cowboy boots. And uh, so they were showing their product to my dad and thought, hey, do you think that this could uh, be something that you could uh, sell in the United States? So he took a few samples and started traveling around the United States showing the boots, and then he made a business out of it. Now, when you got into it, you were still a kid when this was all around you. so. I have some questions here from some folks, and this first question is kind of a blend of my personal curious question and a question from Adrian Cortez on Instagram. So the first part is my, my question. I kind of want to know what the golden era of cowboy boots was like since you were a part of it. Like what, what time span was that? And then I'm interested to know why you decided to stay in the family business, which is Adrian's question. So why are you in cowboy boots? Okay, yeah, yeah, happy to. So golden age of cowboy boots, that's probably, that probably predates me, to be honest. Okay. But the moment at which the industry was its, at its largest in terms of volume, that would have been around 1981. And uh, so the industry, along with the population of the United States, had just grown and grown and grown because cowboy boots were actually like a mainstream product up until the very early, ages, uh, early 80s when uh, you had um, synthetically made shoes, stuff that we love, like Nike tennis shoes and everything. When that showed up, that's when things which were handmade and made out of leather started to decline. So in 1981, not only was it mainstream, but it also became a fad around the world because there were tendencies until then that pretty much culminated in a John Travolta film called The Urban Cowboy. And yep. everyone in the world wanted to wear cowboy boots. That fad eventually, you know, uh, that bubble burst. And since about 1983, um, also with the advent of machine-made shoes, cowboy boots have basically never recovered. The industry has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So you might ask, and you already did, but to add another dimension to that, why would you stay in the business? Why would you join the cowboy boot company and want to take it into the future? And mind you, this is still my dad's company. He still comes to work every day. He's, 19, he's um, 89 years old and no one keeps him. Well, right now with the Corona thing, he stays home, mm -hmm. but nothing keeps him from showing up at nine in the morning every single day and leaving at five in the afternoon every single day. And he still runs it like he's 25 years old and Love talks it. to clients on the phone and everything. Clients, by the way, always retailers in our case. So the reason that I stay in it, um, you know, curiously, um, maybe a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, but uh, one of the, well, the only slogan that has been on our cowboy boot boxes since probably before I was born. Our slogan is handcrafted with pride on the one side because they're handcrafted. On the other side, I think the word pride has come to mean a lot more over the years because we actually keep doing what we do out of sheer stubbornness, out of sheer pride for what we do. It is 
stubborn, maybe even foolish to make a cowboy boot that's made the way it used to be made when you could be doing things which are more profitable, when you could be cutting corners and or just not even making cowboy boots, maybe something else. But we make them still so fully traditional, um, the way that boots used to be made in 1965 and 1975 and even 1981. And we just do it as a matter of pride. Um, for me personally, it's an immense amount of pride that I have for the brand that my dad started and it only builds onto that pride when we hear testimonial from consumers who 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 have bought our boots from retailers for years and years and years and uh, so we always get stories which pretty much from people who love the boots who have uh, had pairs that have lasted them years and resold them over and over so it's become something that you just can't let go of you have to keep fueling it and you have to keep at it yeah, and it definitely shows too. I mean, from the moment that I first tried a Hondo boot, like, I don't know, it must have been uh, uh, just over a year ago in Country Square Western where I was like, wow, this is, this is definitely different, even though it shouldn't be different because it's just the way that it has been for years and years. But that's also because you're very nice and you've been very good to us and everyone knows that. So. <laughs> well, you guys deserve it. Um, Speaking of the way that you do things, there was a question that came through from um, Bernard and a couple other people on Instagram, is that what differentiates your boots specifically in comparison to other brands in quality and materials that makes you so stubborn in the way that you do things? Sure. You can find some brands out there where if you stand them next to a Hondo, we're on the same uh, footing, basically, no pun intended. But still, um, the way we make boots is a choice. Every boot maker has that choice. There's no mystery in the way our boots are made. If you have a playbook from the way boots used to be made in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you would be able to make a Hondo boot. So there's no secret at all there. Uh, what it is, is just leather on leather. Let's say it that way. So um, in a boot, you have the... Uh, the outside, the leather that you see, the leather that you're featuring, and on the inside, you have nothing but lining. So that's leather on leather. Same thing down here in the soles. There's a leather insole inside and a leather outsole inside, and the, that is also just joined leather on leather with nothing in between. It's the stuff in between which you never see, which um, is there for reasons that you could call modern, let's say. In some cases, it's there for reasons that make it easier or cheaper in the uh, in the uh, and more economical to produce in other words and yours don't have that uh well ours are just the old way uh we've never learned any new tricks we um probably have never cared to make that investment also because if there's a machine made process which you could incorporate into the boots well you have to buy that machine first and then have the savings in the long run and we've we've never had that vision we're We've never been smart enough to do things <laughs> differently than, than how we started. And then if you add to that all the compliments we get for not doing anything different, we just kind of stay where we are. Makes sense. To the question itself, leather insoles, leather outsoles, lining on the foot just, just as much as on the vamp, stacked sole leather heels. You can see it here a little bit because it's a bit of a natural finish. So all of those little layers, everything that looks like wood, even when I was a kid, I thought it was wood, is just leather. Leather can become that hard. There's another thing which um, I don't think we've even spoken about too much, the times that we have um, spoken. Um, that same sort of uh, stack leather that you see there, you can appreciate how thick it is. That's what the heel counter is made out of too. This tough, tough heel counter, has about that much, about that much leather thickness in it too. So um, leather counters, um, steel shank, and this little rubber heel cap. That's the only stuff which isn't leather, and some stitching here and there. Right, right, yeah. The uh, the heel counter I feel is something that is probably the most, the most the the part of the boot that the most shortcuts are taken by most companies. It's like, as long as it stands up straight, then like ship it out. But I've noticed that in some companies it does crack and begin to sag. And then the whole boot just sort of just sags and it just doesn't look good. Um, so I like the leather and the counter for sure. 
Um, speaking of where you make your boots, uh, have they always been made in Mexico or have you ever made boots in the US, US as, as well? well? They were always made in Mexico. So when you're in El Paso, you can literally stand on any street and look across and you see uh, Ciudad Juarez or Juarez, which is just across from El Paso. That's where our boots were made for the first 35 years of the history of our, of our brand in a factory that was owned by us. Um, everything that would happen in there was um, according to the way we thought it needed to be made. So uh, around the year 2000, we uh, went all the way to León to uh, just, you know, there are, there are efficiencies in going to León because there are factories that make brands for, uh, for several companies. So we also have factories that make the boots for us. And the standards that we used to keep in our own factory until the year 2000 are the ones that I fly over to León every once in a while to make sure to impose. Um, the boots, the way we have them right now, they come out, I would say, 99% as what we used to have when we had our own factory. That other 1% is just because you can't control everything. You can control the way that boots are made, the materials that go into it, but then every factory has maybe a tiny percentage of their own um, spice that they put into it. Not in terms of the materials, but maybe the way they round this edge or they sky this little part of the boot. So, um, but Leon is really amazing. I've been to factories. I've been to the Tacovas, the factory that makes Tacovas as well. And you'll find about 20 different brands there. Ours is not among them, but you'll find Tony Lama. You'll find Fry. You'll find um, lots of other brands. It's amazing. That's it? Roper too? I, I believe so. It's like a mm -hmm. wonderland in there. And the reason I bring up that point is because those factories are amazing. They have all of these brands being made side by side, and the characteristics are respected to the T. If we still had this factory across the border from El Paso, I don't know where I would start in, have, in making 20 different brands for customers and keeping the characteristics so well segregated. Is that because the economics of the way that uh, the factories are set up in Mexico just makes it so much more cheaper to produce than in the United States and they're just set up for it? Like, why is that? The why of Leon nowadays. Also, why not across from El Paso? That industry has left also Ciudad Juarez, which is just across. Okay. If you rewind to about 40 years, a lot of boots and shoes and leather were being produced either in Juarez or Guadalajara or Leon, or there might be something else out there, probably Monterey. Yeah, in fact, Monterey was making a lot of uh, leather. And um, Leon just became the epicenter of it. It started to just... Um, uh, gain more momentum and other cities took a turn for other kinds of industries to where pretty much Leon is the end all be all. And that goes for all of North America. There is no focus point anymore in the United States. Before leather was Boston, by the way, where you are. That's where leather used to come from. We used to buy tons of it and ship it just across to Juarez to make our own boots in our own factory. Cool. And then, and then El Paso used to be the cowboy boot capital of the world because by far more pairs were made in El Paso, Texas, all leather handcrafted boots for the most part because of the uh, years that we're referring to here, uh, the 80s and then throughout the 90s, that's when stuff started to really slow down here in El Paso. And um, my point being, more pairs were made in El Paso than any other place in the world, in including Leon by a far, by, by a long shot as well. But things change for better or for worse, things change. Yep, I hear you. So you have the factory now, do you offer, and this is a question from Victor and Leonard, do you have options for built to order boots or maybe custom built services like choices of color and things like this? Yeah, halfway there. So first of all, if you see a Hondo style and you want a different color or a different toe or a different heel, um, then you ask your retailer if they are uh, cool with it. Um, ordering a special made pair for you. Not all retails will, retailers will be cool with it because um, I'll just say it flat out. 
sometimes a retailer can t can tell you, hey, you know, it's uh, it can take a long time. It can take three to four months, no matter where you're making them. Also from Anderson Bean or whatever, they'll tell you, hey, it's going to take three to four months and this and that. So they're basically asking you in this world of instant gratification, they're asking you to be very patient. And most of us are not. So a lot of retailers, they would rather say flat out, no, thank you, because Again, I don't want to upset the customer base, uh, people, uh, consumers that I'm speaking to right now. But then they tell you three weeks, they tell you three months, maybe sooner, and you're calling them two weeks later and the week after that <laughs> and the week after that and the week after that. And it happens because I know from my own retailers. And then they can get extremely angry with us as well when that two months became three months, became four months. So it might sound like, Phil, shouldn't you just get your act together and make special made quicker and uh, make everyone happy it's tough guys when you're making all leather handcrafted boots a lot of things can get in the way and some with the best intentions you want to um ship even a 50 pair order can ship later than you hope that that it would so that one pair order it's especially painful because there's a there is an actual consumer waiting for it on the other end and a lot of uh, feelings can get hurt in the process so um where we don't go is in making any special boots which are literally literally custom where you would step on a piece of paper and draw your foot on a paper and maybe take measurements of your instep in fact I don't, I wouldn't even know how to do that. Um, for all the time that we have been in business, we work with lasts, lasts, which already dictate the contours of our boots and the sizes. We are making this boot, for example, with a pink top and a really high heel and uh, maybe a pointed toe, you know, it happens, we do it. And uh, it's just Patience is the name of the game. You got to go easy on the retailers that uh, that do it for you. And as far as taking those orders directly, we don't. We pay a ton of respect to the relationship between retailer and and manufacturer, and then retailer and uh, consumer. We we still tread very carefully in not crossing that line. Yes, and that seems to be one of the big questions that I get because even though you have that respect between retailer and yourself that sort of limits where your boots can be purchased. So a lot of people are wondering, um, why don't you sell direct to consumer? And that is basically the reason, so you don't go over the heads of the people who you work with, uh, your retailers and stuff, correct? Correct, correct. And uh, so it goes without saying, we could be in a lot more shops as well. So um, if uh, half of the shops in America are watching this live stream, Feel free to send us an order. Um, so um, other than that, uh, we're coming from a uh, angle where the way it was always done is to sell to stores. And a lot of the stores, for example, you mentioned um, Country Square. Um, these are stores that we've had for decades and decades as clients. We depend on those store owners, those private individual store owners, we depend on them enormously because they're the ones that explain to the consumer why the heck is this boot twice or three times the cost of the thing that's sitting right next to it, the other boot that is sitting right next to it. So it doesn't matter how much literature you hang on the boot here in your little, uh, in your little label on the back. You really need a store clerk to walk up to someone and say, oh, you're looking for good boots. Come over here. Let me take you to this boot that you may or may not have seen the first time you went by, you went through. So um, you, you turn into a cut and dry um, business strategy where your boots are sitting right next to other boots in, uh, in a website or something like that. And there's less chance that you can convince and prove to people why it should cost what it costs. Um, not to say anything negative here, but you almost get the same effect when you're looking at chain stores with 200 stores, chains of 200 stores, have management level, have staff. Staff is usually there just for, you know, months or a couple of weeks. It's just like, you know, I used to work at Express for Men when I was in high school and it was just for three months or something like that. So, so that's how the uh, staff comes in and out of those stores. And they also will, and management in those stores will also 
could never really be able to explain what's inside of the Hondo uh, to, uh, to a consumer. So we really depend so, so much on the informed independent store owner that it begs the question, why would you do anything? Why would you attempt to weaken their position? If you can basically tell them on top of everything, Hondo is almost like an exclusive brand for you in your store. You, can, you, know, you know that Boot Barn doesn't have it across the street. Yeah, and Mad Taylor has a good point here about they're still, they still are affordable. And when you think about it oh, on the long run, if you have a traditionally made boot, it's going to be able to be resold, uh, last you a decade. So really, you get a really good ROI on a boot that's made like this. And that's why I also encourage people to go to those um, little indie boot stores too, to, to see the different variety that they have and to be fit properly for a new boot. And having said all of that, the pressure to sell online is enormous because it's um, you, um, you know, when um, when the Internet first showed up, you didn't know if radio would survive. And it has survived at this point. I hate to put it this way, but we don't know if stores will exist in 10 years, any kind of versus um, ordering everything and let it come to your doorstep because it works. It works really well, especially with return everything you didn't like policies. So we have enormous pressure to make sure we don't go extinct by thinking, sure, the shops will be there. Um, sadly, the number of shops that we used to sell to in 1989, I would say only 10% are left independent stores. A lot of them have been sucked up by the boot barns and the uh, cavenders and so on of, of the world. Uh, but then a lot of them have also just closed because it was a family business as well. And when the next generation didn't want to take it on, then that was the end of the store. A lot of many stores closed in good health, ironically, you know. So um, so we have only seen the number of stores shrink. So there's enormous pressure to sell online. And this might be the year where we really start to make major inroads into that. Let's say that for the moment. We're running a few tests trying to see what, what comes out of it. So are there places right now where you can get hondos online? That's a question from Jared Packer. Yeah, my favorite online stores where you can uh, buy our boot belong to our own retail clients. So brick and mortar store, the ones who have actually done a good job of putting together a website. So NRS World, for example, has a beautiful, they, they feature our boots beautifully on their website because they know what they're doing in terms of, of e-commerce and it's a good user experience. And then we have um, independents who have their own store. Uh, like you, we could say um, Picosa Creek Outfitters, Diamond V Western out of California as well. These are places where when you're desperate, when you're actually desperate trying to find a pair of Hondo boots online and you search and search and search, these are the, the names that you find on there. And then these people just call it in, ask us, hey, do you have this pair of boots? And we send it over to them. Um, NRS, on the other hand, has a big stock on the floor, so they have plenty of boots to offer online. So we were just talking about this online sort of in-person retail thing, but with the way that things are right now with coronavirus, um, how is Hondo? How are you being affected by that? That's a question from Jay Fox on Facebook. Well, we, uh, we made a quick move to list about 12 of our styles on Amazon. So this might be something we had to do to respond to the current situation. But when we all get healthy again, I guess we're going to leave them on there as well uh, if, it, uh, if it pays off. And this might just be our start down that path. But we're always going to have to be very, very sensitive about uh, taking care of the retailers. And um, the only thing we can think is to make sure to be not never below the retail price of our own retailers and maybe a small buffer more expensive as well. Um, still thinking of the physical world, um, we would sell to consumers who are literally 200 miles too far from a retailer that, um, that 
that has our boots. So the thinking is that I have to drive those 150 miles, uh, which you would spend on gas. Maybe that's just the same of the small, of the slightly more expensive prices that we have on Amazon. So that's the best we can do right now, trying to, um, to not undercut our retailers, give everyone a reason to go to the shop first. And then if you're really up creek, then order from us online. And that's not the attitude you hear from any online seller, right? <laughs> Trying to avoid <laughs> selling online, but uh, that's where we are with it right now. So moving away from the serious sales stuff and the, and the COVID situations, um, let's move over to some trends. I mean, you've been to the conferences, you go to these places, you know the trends. So what are you seeing right now in terms of toe shapes like what what is going to be changing in the trends of a cowboy boot coming soon that's a great question because um before you mentioned the toes that would have been my answer so um most of the boots we sell are still this square toe double welt stitch the double welt stitch has never really sold great in the pacific northwest where a lot of boots are sold probably a lot more than people realize if you're just thinking Texas, Oklahoma, and Colorado. Uh, but um, Idaho, um, Oregon, Washington, tons of boots are there. They've always been a little more traditional, but still the square toe double welt stitch, which has never really been my preferred look. Uh, here you have it, a boot maker who is telling you, I don't even like that look. But what we have coming back are the round toes, which we have never abandoned. Uh, when and square and double weld stitch was it we were still selling a lot of single weld stitch round toes so rubber sole on this style by the way so um that's coming is that the back. 75 78 this is a 78 75 designed in 1978 uh one of our top sellers since 1978 so it's just a simple uh work leather with a rubber sole uh, but everything's still made the way they used to be made. So cowhide lining all the way, um, leather insole, uh, hard leather heel counter, and stacked sole leather heels as well. So um, the other thing which I think might really kick in is the, um, yeah. the medium round, which is uh, less round than this, a little bit more pointed. Mm -hmm. We used to sell tons of that in the 80s, tons of it. And then one fine day, everyone just grew terribly sick of it. And the square toe double weld stitch just buried it, buried it. But it used to... I could never get sick of that. <laughs> I love the medium round. It used to be 50% of the sales, quite honestly. And the other 50 was the, the U-toe. We have a number for it, but traditionally this is called the U-toe. The mm -hmm. medium round traditionally is called the R-toe. We have a number for it as well, not a letter, but uh, but basically our toe, medium round toe, or our number eight. Um, it used to be um, it used to be it, and it's a beautiful toe. I don't have a sample of it here right now, but you might just see it coming soon to a store near you um, across all the brands. Awesome! I look forward to trying it uh, in in more stores. That was a question from Bernard. Thank you so much for that. That was a good one. Also got a question about exotic boots. Now, you have some ostrich, uh, but what about caiman or other leathers? Are you thinking about introducing those into Hondo at some point? We are a small boot company, but we act like a big one, meaning that we sell across the whole spectrum. Then you have some niche companies, especially new ones, who will only do exotic. So they'll only do Cayman, they'll only do um, ostrich and so on. So if you, you take the whole market and you ask what percentage of what is sold overall is exotic, then it's a small percentage and that's the percentage of it also at our company. So for example, um, we, we do. We do obviously make ostrich and um, Caymans to a lesser extent, uh, but it is a project which interests me to uh, to offer a bit more variety in exotics and promote it a bit harder and to grow our sale there. If we end up being a little bit out of uh, proportion after all, where if 10% of the market is exotic, but we end up selling 20% of our boots exotic, then um, it might be it might be a good thing to start. Uh, well, it's a plan that I have this year to uh, diversify a little more in the skills, in the skins that we offer and, um, 
and uh, the places where you can find them. What is on your wish list? Like if you could do one exotic that you don't do right now, which one would it be? Well, I hate to say something insensitive, but, and this might be quite anticlimactic, but I wish we could make a lot more kangaroo. Yes, okay. Leather which, this is a leather which used to sell a, a lot in the 80s. If I'm always talking about the 80s is because that was kind of the golden age. The golden age two. The golden age part one, I would say, is back when John Wayne was having boots made for him and Harry Truman was having boots made for them. But Throughout the 80s, when there was a lot of volume, early 80s, kangaroo was a major, major leather, and it's a fantastic leather. The reason I say that I'm saying that carefully is because the poor kangaroo is just up being barbecued in Australia, unfortunately, with the uh, fire a few months ago. But it is a wonderful leather. Why do I call it exotic? Because it requires all of the tough, difficult documentation that caiman requires as well, that alligator requires. Ostrich, you would be surprised. This is a leather which requires hardly any um, of the documentation that exotics require because um, ostrich is like beef in South Africa. They have huge, huge farms. The meat, I think, is number one in that market. And then there's tons of leather to go around. So it is a farm-raised animal which is consumed um, intensely. Um, other animals are more protected, such as caiman, such as alligators, such as kangaroos, and so on and so forth. Lizards, snakes, pythons, all of this. And when you move that across borders, you require a lot of heavy documentation. So kangaroo, even though it's a, I didn't describe it, it's a very smooth, very glazed, uh, very tough leather you'd be surprised it's a relatively thin leather but uh i don't want to go as far to say that you could stick a knife into it but it can take a lot and uh so even though it's a smooth leather you could confuse it for water buffalo or calf or something like that by just looking at it wow it is an exotic in the sense that it requires a lot of work to bring back and forth interesting that wasn't anticlimactic at all it comes from Australia. That's the first border cross. And then and if you have to make them in the, or Mexico for the United States market, then that's another border that you have to cross. Wow. I love that answer. Thank you. Thank you for – actually, that was asked by several people, so that was a great question. <laughs> um, so going back to where people can get Hondos, there's a couple of Canadians – here that want to know how they can get hondos is there any retailers in canada oh yeah plenty of, well um several of them <laughs> never going to say plenty in terms of uh, <laughs> of our business model because we could sell to a lot more stores but it's the same thing it's stores which are independent uh that that appreciate our boots our brand has been in canada for 50 years basically so it's well known by some old timers over there and the old timers that own the stores, the ones that keep buying from us. And uh, so Alberta, lots of options in um, Alberta and um, none in the big cities. They're all in the small towns, which is the same basically model that you find in the United States. So, um, hard to find a kind of large city um, except for Fort Worth stockyards and Oklahoma City stockyards. But other than that, excuse me. Other than that, it's um, small cities like Haver, Montana, like um, Snohomish, Washington, um, yep. really, really tiny towns. So in Canada, Alberta is where you're going to find them, not really Ontario, um, a little in British Columbia. And again, we could sell a lot more. So if anyone out there wants to send us an order. <laughs> so the Canadians get into hondoboots.com, go to the contact form, the contact me form in, on hondoboots.com and tell me where you are, basically. What town are you in? And I may be able to tell you which is the closest retailer that you've got there. Are the boots also available on Canadian Amazon, if that's a thing? Not yet. That's a next okay. move that we could make. So uh, that, that's actually on my uh, uh, list of tasks. You got a big list. <laughs> Don't we all? 
<laughs> Love it. <laughs> Phil, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. Uh, that is all the questions. So there was a lot of questions come through. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. These were really great. Like a lot of these I wouldn't have thought of. Do you have anything that you want to leave people with? I do. I do. I always like to take time to make sure that everyone out there appreciates you and what you do. Because no one out there is doing what you do. Bringing boots and bringing the industry to a digital meeting. You walked right into it, Jeremiah, but it takes talent too. So um, I really appreciate what you do. I think a lot of boot companies should be aware of what you do and, uh, and prize it. So uh, the audience out there, make sure you're saying thanks, Jeremiah, a lot more often than we do it. They already do a lot. It's, it's my pleasure. I, I love sharing my passion and love sharing the passion that people have for this, including the passion that you, you have for it as a brand too. So thank you so much. For, for saying that and thank you for joining me today. This is was this was a great live stream with some great stuff. So thanks for everybody for watching too. Phil, have a great rest of your day and stay healthy out there, would you? You too. Everyone needs to be doing that as a first priority. A lot of stores for are real. closed, so just wait a couple weeks until they, <laughs> until everything is, is back back online. Yes, can't wait till it's back to normal. All right, Phil. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thank you, you too.